This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Bang. The sky is the limit. From sunsets to Bill Monroe's famous blue moon of Kentucky, we take a look at how the heavens above help us appreciate the countryside below. Many constellations themselves are named for wildlife. And every now and then, Mother Nature has a trick of her sleeve, such as in the summer of 17, as western Kentucky prepares for nightfall in the middle of the afternoon. We go inside outdoors to shed light on the night, next on Kentucky Afield Radio. Who's ready for a boatload of laughs? Give it up for Funny Sunny! Thanks. I found it. A use for a life jacket. A pillow! <laughs> hey, I'm not going to wear a life jacket. I know how to swim. <laughs> how can it hurt you? It's just water. This chick's hysterical. Funny sunny, everyone. She'll be here all week. Maybe. Kentucky Conservation Officers remind you, your life jacket's got your back. April 30th is a day you should circle on your calendar, but so is today. Sportsmen and women, you need to get your name in the hat for fabulous Kentucky elk hunting. April 30th is the absolute last day to enter. So while you're thinking about it, and you know you want to, register today. The Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website is the one and only place to register, and it's as close as your PC. 900 names will be drawn. Yours could be one. Kentucky Elk Hunting. Register at fw.ky.gov. Welcome to Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. Anyone who enjoys the outdoors pays more attention to the sky than they probably realize. The sun, the moon, the stars, they play into our life as well as into the lives of wild creatures. Many game laws are based on the sun's position in the sky. Sunrise, sunset. We have starfish, sunfish. We have the Cumberland Falls moonbow. We call ourselves on occasion night owls, despite the fact that human beings were designed to be active during the day. Think back to seventh grade science class. It teaches us the importance of the sun for plants, photosynthesis. It also teaches the benefits of darkness. Sleep cycles play into this. Darkness helps to keep our biological clock set. Animals rely on darkness to evade predators. Migrating birds use the moon and the stars as navigational aids, similar to old-time ships at sea. They pilot their boats by the use of stars. Many kids grow up with a backyard telescope. My guest today did. Astronomy has been a lifelong hobby of his, along with one other thing that at least he and I share in common radio broadcasting. For his day job, he is the operations manager at the Kentucky News Network. But at night, he calls himself the star geezer. Mark Stephen Williams, welcome to the show. My pleasure. We both have been in radio since the dawn of time, and it wasn't until, I want to say, recent years that I knew that you were a stargazer, an astronomer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To what degree do you do that? I am a passionate amateur astronomer, Charlie. I love watching the night sky. Cultures throughout time have had a great respect and love and enjoyment of the night sky. The Celts, the Druids, they used the stars as calendars to map when do we plant, when do we harvest, when do we get ready for winter, when is it a good time to travel. There's always something interesting going on in the sky. You're not that old. But you call yourself the stargazer. That's clever. Stargazerastronomy.com. And I'm just looking at your card. Astronomy, science events, schools, church, private parties. You do this sort of an outreach. It's not just something you do for fun, isn't it? Well, the reason that I started with this was a very practical one, because light trespass and light pollution. And we're losing the night sky to urban light wasted we waste billions billions of dollars and millions of kilowatts in misdirected light your program is about wildlife lighting will change the habits of predators and prey predators don't go out as much on a full moon night because the prey knows that the predators will be able to see them 
this light can affect circadian rhythms. It affects the production of melatonin, which is linked to cancer. So my initial reason for getting into astronomy outreach was community education about the outdoor lighting issue. And from there, it just took off. One thing I had read long ago about moths, they will use the moon as a means to guide themselves along. For navigation, right. Now, granted, they still fly when it's cloudy, and they get where they're going. But the moon is an aid, and they will fly with their body sort of at an angle to it, knowing that they will never get there, that lets them get other places they're going here on Earth, mm-hmm. plants and what have you. Mm-hmm. But if they see a street light, they will mistake that for the moon. They fly at an angle to it. Generally, they get there. Mm-hmm. And that results in a spiraling nightmare by the moth. That's why they're just simply going in circles. Mm-hmm. If you've heard the story about sea turtles, I had a friend in Texas, San Padre Island National Seashore, and she says, yeah, you got to have the moon and the stars because the twinkling on the ocean tells the sea turtle where home is. Mm-hmm. And I think that affects them as they come ashore to lay their eggs. They know where the sea is. Right. They have a context mm-hmm. of where the ocean is, where the sand dune mm-hmm. is. If they see bright lights of a city... That'll throw them off. Mm -hmm. I mean, the natural cycle of things, we're supposed to have day and night. The night sky is a natural resource, and probably 90% of the population has never seen a truly dark sky to get away and, and see the Milky Way and see double stars and see all these wonderful things. I'm a member of the Louisville Astronomical Society. We do a lot of outreach in town, in the metro area, but if we want to get away and do astrophotography or do some really nice stargazing, we go to Crawford County, Indiana, which is about 45, 50 miles out of town, southern Indiana, west of Louisville, and they have a beautiful facility there, the James Baker Center for Astronomy, wonderful roll-off roof observatory, 16-inch telescope and all that, but we have to drive 50 miles if we want to go see a dark sky, and then, even then, you can see, you know, for 10 or 15 degrees above the horizon, you can see the light dome of Louisville yeah. or Brandenburg or wherever. Put your lights on a timer or a motion sensor. Turn it off. If you point your lights down and don't use excessive lighting, you'll save a lot. You'll save energy. It takes 20 to 30 minutes for your eyes to dark adapt. That's when your eyes finally get used to the dark. They go into night mode. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I am a photographer of sorts. I like to try, at least, to take pictures of the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. I've done it, but to find a dark sky is next to impossible. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine and I went out in December and went out to Chimney Top Rock in Red River Gorge. Wow. And it's dark out there. Mm-hmm. Finally, you find a place that's dark. Mm-hmm. You look around. Because you've got to bear in mind, your camera is going to be have a shutter speed of about 15 seconds. And so the periphery around the horizon, if there are cities out there, Slade, for example, or Beattyville, any lights shining from out there will show up mm-hmm. along the horizon. Right. We call that a light dome, by the way. A light dome. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's hard to find dark sky. Absolutely. There are folks now that have astronomy resorts, bed and breakfasts. A lot of them are in New Mexico, Arizona. The International Dark Sky Association is out, based out of Arizona. Some communities now have lighting ordinances. Thou shalt not shine thy light on the neighbors, you know, across your property line. And, it's, and they it's, take it's, it seriously. Yeah, a, a, absolutely. But like I a say, lot of places they would just see that as simply a joke. You can be efficient. Either turn it off, put it on a motion sensor so it only comes on when you're out there walking around. Use common sense. Okay, Mark, Stephen, let's talk about people's fascinations with the sky. For me, it'll go back to Star Trek or maybe Lost in Space. Mm-hmm. There was um, there were a few even before that that came about with John Glenn being the first sure. orbit. Uh, but since then, we have Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica and Holy Cow, the list as long as you're armed. Mm-hmm. I don't think that people will ever stop being fascinated with the night sky. Do you? It's like a walk in the forest. It's like rafting down a river. The enjoyment and the contemplation of the universe naturally restores you. I mean, it's it, without knowing any of the science... 
You can walk out in the backyard. You don't have to know, I'm looking at Jupiter, or I'm it's looking tranquil. at... It's tranquil. It's tranquil, and it's amazing, and it's calming. We have some astronomers in our heritage, Copernicus, Galileo, Hubble. Why do these cool guys only have one name? Well, those are generally their last names. What, are they, what do they call you? Do they just call you Williams? Hey, you. No, no. They don't call you William. Uh, they call me MSW, or Geezer, or Hey, you. That's the deal. Astronomy is the topic. More after the break on Kentucky Field Radio. We're back on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. One of the more dramatic solar events for the United States takes part in large part in western Kentucky, coming up August of 2017. We'll get into that in our next half hour. But for now, meanwhile, let's talk about the night sky that we can see here in Kentucky. See, you're out on a hunting trip, fishing trip, camping trip. Lots of stars up there. All types of different configurations we call constellations. And know it or not, we sort of learn the sky. But when we go on a vacation or a cruise, we look up and see the sky. Hey, it looks a little different than back here at home. In Argentina, the man on the moon is upside down there. Mark Stephen Williams, astronomer from Louisville, is my guest. And Mark, how is that? Well, at the same latitude, everything's the same. Always the same. Okay, always the same. Okay. If you go north or south, that's when it changes. If you go to the North Pole, the Big Dipper is going to be straight overhead. Where is the North Star when you're at the North Pole? It's pretty much right over your head. Right overhead. That's another marvelous thing about astronomy. If you know the night sky, you'll never get lost. If you can find the Big Dipper, that points you to Polaris, which is the North Star. And at the equator, you may only be able just to see the tail of the Big Dipper. And if you go south of the equator, you can't we'll see, see it at all. any of the Big Dipper. Yeah. And, but, but conversely, here in Kentucky, or, or what they call the, the mid-temperate latitudes here in North America, we can't see things like the Southern Cross or things down in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. I've never seen it. I want to go down to South America to see that. I have been to Australia. And I honestly looked up at the sky and didn't recognize a thing. Right. It does look different. Mm -hmm. For as many millions of stars as there are out there, you get used to seeing them. Mm -hmm. And over a lifetime, they do look the same mm -hmm. night after night mm -hmm. after night. Mm -hmm. But if you go somewhere down below the equator, it's different. Exactly right. A given star rises four minutes earlier every night. Okay, so in a month, those will move about an hour. That's why we have the seasons. So when I see Orion, for instance, when I first see Orion in the evening sky, I know that it's late summer or early fall. We talked a little bit. We were going to talk about calendars. The phrase dog days of summer was coined because Sirius, the brightest star we see in the sky, is the dog star, and it's in the constellation Canis Major, which is Orion's dog right below him. Sirius is the nearest, brightest star. It's about eight light years away. So the reason we call it the dog days of summer is that in late June, early July, we start just start to see that star pop up on the eastern horizon in the evening. It's the dog star, hence the dog days of mm -hmm. summer. So, makes so sense now. Let me ask you this. Do you wear a watch? Would you have to wear a watch to survive? Would you have to have a calendar? No. As learned no, as you no, are in this? No. No, because, I mean, it's become a... Now, we all have our smartphones now. Time and calendars are a fascination. This being 2016, this year is a leap year. We have a February 29th in this year. Why do we have a leap year? Well, leap year days are inserted in the calendar so the calendar won't get out of sync with the sun because the actual tropical or solar year is 365 and a quarter days. 
at a quarter day. So a quarter of a day would be six hours. It's like 365.24, blah, 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 blah. So it's a little less than a quarter. So how do you make up for that little less than a quarter? Well, the challenge is because the solar year is... 365 and kind of a quarter days long if those start to add up that's why we had the we had the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar and and the Gregorian calendar reformation if you will in I think it was 1582 was all about the fact that because our days were getting out of sync what was happening was that the calendar then was falling behind the sun so for planting for harvesting for hunting we want to know when is the vernal equinox the the first day of spring when is it time to plant i mean the calendars were really evolved to help with things like planting and harvesting and when is it going to be safe for me to move is it you know winter coming so we know where we are so this is why we have a leap year day to keep the calendar in sync with the sun we're talking about it's not precise so if it's two four point whatever whatever that's close to a quarter how do you make up that other 10 minutes or well, whatever it might you see, be you see now th- then at then, some point it's going to get off still you're going to have to go in there every what 25 or 50 years and add another day okay. would you not okay here is something from a paper if the tropical year remains at its 1900 value of 365.24198781825 days the gregorian calendar would be 3 days 17 minutes 33 seconds behind the sun after 10,000 years uh, uh, exactly. <laughs> like my point exactly <laughs> uh, these effects will cause the calendar to be nearly a day behind in the year 30 200. So they're right. going to have to go in there and change it then. This means there should be fewer and fewer leap days as times go on, as time goes on, and a possible reform would be to omit the leap day in 3200, keep 3600 and 4000 as leap years. There you go. And and, and we even I use we, you, you talked about my watch and, and all this. One of the things I use is the National Bureau of Standards time signal WWV. Some years they add a second. But see to complicate it and they don't tell us? Well, no, they tell us. They they know, you know, and if you're a geek, I've actually been up, and they do that on New Year's Eve. But the other thing that complicates it is Earth speeds up and slows down because the years are varying lengths. So, And one of the things that slows it down is the tides. We get mail, viewer mail. It's called Facebook. But we've had some people ask some questions that maybe you, sir, can answer. So, listener Q&A. Uh, Cole Gilbert from Graffenburg, Kentucky. Hello, says, Cole. Cole wants to know, how soon will we have any confirmation on Planet Nine? Okay. Uh, of course, Planet Nine used to be Pluto. Pluto was decommissioned back in 2006-2007 by the International Astronomical Union. The reason Pluto got demoted was, as we get more information, we find there's more other stuff out there. All right? Pluto is more like one of the probably thousands of little bodies, those Kuiper Belt objects that are out there, probably 50 to 100 uh, astronomical units out. And then beyond that, we have the Oort cloud, which is kind of comets. So what Brown and Mr. Batigan have discovered is that a bunch of these Kuiper Belt objects are being gravitationally influenced somehow. They're lining up in groupings. And so what these two astronomers are deriving from that is there has to be something out there that is gravitationally perturbing the orbits of these guys to make them line up this way. It's the size of, I think, two or three sizes, the radius of Earth, and I think it's it's probably a gassy object they just don't know so their theory is there's something out there and probably it's another planet so okay. somebody's going to somebody's going to have to find it and that's planet 9 yes planet 9 or it had a nickname i think the thing was called nibiru okay nibiru but but it's planet 9 and then then after that news came out somebody tweeted 
Hey, I'm Pluto. I'm already Planet Nine. That's a long year. Any confirmation of we accept this as a planet, as we know planets, may not come? Or what do you suspect? Well, we have to find it first, and it depends on if it's way, way out there. Do we have the telescope ability to look at it and find it? You know, scientists, they do amazing things now, so, you know, we don't even know where to look yet. These people are extremely bright, and we'll find out. Ann Ackerman listens in southern Alabama. Hi, Ann. Which one of those stars out there is her lucky star? Oh, the term lucky stars, we use that all the time. Do you have a lucky star? Well, well some of that's marketing, you know. Uh, it was also a Madonna song. I guess the lucky star is the star that you may, may see shining above you on a night that something wonderful, wonderful happens. What I do uh, when I do an astronomy outreach event, I do birthday stars. So, for instance, I have a grand daughter who is eight and a half years old now so right now Sirius is her birthday star I'm 68 years old my birthday star this year is Aldebaran when I go out and look at Aldebaran and I think gee these little photons this light that's hitting my eye tonight left that star the year when I was born. Nice. Okay. You just need to think that. Understand what you're saying. So, Ann, that, let that be your lucky star, and I'm not going to ask your age. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I can't really tell, but from her picture, I'd say she's 22, 23 years old. Mark Stephen Williams is my guest this hour, and we have a fishing report standing by. After that, we'll get more into the topic of the total solar eclipse heading the way of Hopkinsville next summer. My name's Charlie Baglin. You are listening Listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. Bagwood back on Kentucky Afield Radio. Into our second half hour, and if you'd like to hear the show again, pretty easily done. Just go to our Facebook page, and there you will find our weekly link. Put in Kentucky Afield Radio in the search box, and up it will pop. And you can put it on Facebook and share it with your friends or email it. It's that simple. What's biting where? It is time now for our weekly fishing report. Hi, this is John Williams with the Fishery Report for Southeast Kentucky. At Lake Carmel, the fishing's been very good this spring, especially crappie. Seen a lot of black crappie caught up in the creeks on jigs and minnow combinations around shallow structure. There's a lot of flooded timber. Also on Lake Carmel, the black bass has been good uh, in the major creek arms, especially spots, uh, several nice spots caught on jerk baits. And the striper fishing's been very good, casting the banks with doll flies and curly grub combinations, or else fishing live shad. And the night bite for striper should be good for the next at least the next month you can parallel cast the banks at night just listen for the shad up shallow and cast surface baits or subsurface baits and should be able to pick up a limit easily also around the district smallmouth and largemouth have been good at laurel uh, mostly on jigs or swim baits so get out and enjoy the weather as always good luck and good fishing this is rob rolled in the northwestern fishery district with the lack of rainfall both of our reservoirs are having a hard time getting up to summer pool Crappie fishing at both reservoirs has begun to slow down over the last week or so. Although fishermen still are picking up a few fish in some of those brush piles. Bass fishing is picking up on all of our lakes. No Lynn River lakes, it's very good. And catching them generally on crankbaits, spinnerbaits, and chartreuse, fire tiger patterns. Lake Malone, bass are still holding offshore a bit. Ohio River is getting down to a fishable level now. Anglers are starting to pick up a few hybrid striped bass and striped bass below the major dams there at Candleton, Newburgh, Uniontown. Don't forget our Fins Lakes. All of our Fins Lakes have been stocked with trout and catfish this month and last month. Please be safe on the water and always wear your life jackets. At Kentucky and Bartha Lakes down in western Kentucky, it's that time of the year. It's crappie season. The crappie have started moving up shallow, but they're still being caught out deep, so they're kind of in that transitional phase of where you can still spider rig the ledges and catching suspended crappie with minnows and jigs. But at the same time, that water temperature jumped up over 60. The water level's right at summer pool level, and the fish are being found in the bushes. So they're ready to spawn. Some of them are already spawning. And so you can fish anywhere from deep to shallow. Minnows and jigs are typically the primary baits. Hearing a few reports of good bluegill, hearing a few good reports of channel catfish up in the embayment. Seems like the tailwater's doing really well too with striped bass, white bass. 
So it's springtime. It's time to go fishing. This is Paul Reister, and I hope you find a good day to go. How was the wedding? I cried like a baby. Good thing you wore your life jacket. They say you can drown in a teaspoon of water. Makes you think twice about that next cup of coffee. Honey, I'll be outside washing the car. Life jacket. Before you break a sweat. Before your next sad movie. Wear your life jacket. Put on your life jacket and help with the dishes. Dad. Life jackets. You know when they're a stupid idea. You should know when they're not. Kentucky Conservation Officers remind you your life jacket's got your back. April 30th is a day you should circle on your calendar, but so is today. Sportsmen and women, you need to get your name in the hat for fabulous Kentucky elk hunting. April 30th is the absolute last day to enter. So while you're thinking about it, and you know you want to, register today. The Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website is the one and only place to register, and it's as close as your PC. 900 names will be drawn. Yours could be one. Kentucky Elk Hunting. Register at fw.ky.gov. We are back into our second half hour. This is Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and we are talking about the part of Kentucky outdoors called the night sky. Astronomer Mark Stephen Williams from Louisville is in the studio with me. And, Mark, people have been talking about this for quite some time, even though it doesn't happen until August of 2017, the total solar eclipse. We've been taking some Facebook questions along the way here. I have one from a family in southern Indiana, the town of Madison. It's Mark and Missy and their sons, Sam and Zachary. They say they are a stargazing family, backyard astronomers, and they have several questions. When does this eclipse occur? How dark will it get in the middle of the afternoon? Will it trick animals into thinking that it's really night? And will it be so dark in the middle of the afternoon that we will actually see stars in the sky? Great bunch of questions. Okay, let me tell you about the Great American Eclipse of 2017. And this is going to be a monumental thing. This will be the first total solar eclipse, Charlie, to cross the United States. First total to go coast to coast. It's going to come in Monday, August 21st, 2017. Think of it as a highway, okay? About a 70-mile-wide road. That 70-mile-wide road will stretch from Oregon to South Carolina. And it'll go through 12 states. It's going to come in about Carbondale, Illinois, come down through Hopkinsville, just south of Bowling Green, north of Nashville, and on out, okay? So if you were within that swath... Any place on that highway... You would have to look at a map to know exactly where... Yes, any place in that line. So it's going to come down through western Kentucky, through Crittenden, Caldwell, Hopkinsville, and all of that. Anybody within that 70-mile-wide strip gets a total eclipse everywhere in kentucky will get at least about 80 percent i mean if you're in hazard it'll be a slice i mean even up to new york out to the west coast you'll all get a partial eclipse but you got to be in that band to get the total thing all right then on top of that the hopkinsville area from about carbondale illinois down to almost bowling green is the center of the eclipse That little area there, you'll get two minutes and about 42 seconds of totality. Totality is when the sun completely disappears behind the moon, and you can see the solar corona. Mark's question is a a very good one. What I'm telling people, and and we're working right now to do an event, Hopkinsville is expecting 100,000 people. In 2017, the total solar eclipse will be bigger than the Kentucky Derby in Kentucky, okay? All right. Because millions of people across the United States will see this. And I can say the only difference in the area around Hopkinsville, they get a little longer. If you're out in Oregon, you'll get about a minute and 50 seconds. So what will happen, it's not just the 2 minutes and 30 seconds you will get, it will be the whole experience. It will be watching the shadow approach from the west. 
He asks a great question about wildlife. Wildlife will be unsettled. They'll settle down, and they'll think it's going to be nightfall. Will but it, how dark will it be? Well, I mean, it'll get as, not quite as dark as night, but maybe late, late, late twilight. The stars will come out. Venus, Jupiter, and Mars will be kind of in the sky. So three or four minutes, I mean, it'll be like a real fast twilight. The stars will come out. One of the things people want to look for is something called Bailey's Beads. If the eclipse is when the moon is at what we call perigee, which is closest to the Earth, it's a little longer and it covers up more. If it's an apogee eclipse, and lunar eclipses always happen at the full moon, solar eclipses always happen at the new moon because the new moon gets between us and the sun. One of the things you want to watch for is those Bailey's Beads, which are the the little rays of sun peeping around the mountain ridges on the limb of the moon. Animals will settle down. They'll think it's going to be night. Two, two and a half minutes of totality, depending on where you are, and whoosh, then suddenly the shadow will sweep out to the east. It and, becomes daytime. And it'll become daytime again. And this will be uh, in the eastern time zone at about uh, 2.25 in the afternoon that day. Central time zone, 1.25. Can you dare look at it with the naked eye. Ah, okay. Great, great, great question. No. You, I mean, you can during the totality, but you never, ever, ever want to look directly at the sun because you'll put your eye out, kid. What yeah. do you need to take to look at it? Well, I, and I brought one for you. There are several manufacturers, uh, Little Eclipse glasses. This stuff's going to sell like hotcakes. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. These are like the little 3D cardboard things you get at the movies, mm-hmm. little cardboard goggles. He also has a handheld version, and I believe it's got a special mylar, but it filters out like 9998 percent of the light. You either put those on or hold them up. Viewing through a telescope, you put a solar filter on the front of the telescope. Some less expensive uh, telescopes, they give you a little little eyepiece that's got a filter in it, but the heat of the sun through a telescope will crack that, so you put a filter on the front end of the scope. But we'll announce at some point where we're going to be doing our eclipse adventure. We hope to have the eclipse viewers, but you want to be very, very careful. And uh, these things are nice for looking at the sun. You, uh, I have uh, one of the little eclipse viewers that I brought for you, and I just keep it in a little, a little Ziploc bag, and I'm going to give you one of these, because it's fun to go out and look at the sun, look at sunspots. Another thing that's happening this spring is going to be on, uh, I believe it's May 9th, what we call a transit of Mercury. That's also going to be on a Monday, and a transit of Mercury is not as rare as the transits of Venus. Last one of these we had visible in the United States was in 2006. That means comes between the Earth and the Sun. Yes. And you can yes. actually see the planet yes. Yes. against the Sun. Yes, yes. So and again, you, you're looking straight at the Sun. You're looking straight at the Sun, but again, you got to have the proper filter. So either through a filtered telescope or with one of these little eclipse viewers, and, and there will be them, those will be available for a number, number of sources, but Rainbow, Rainbow Symphony is, is a great one. For the transit of Mercury, it's going to appear like a little tiny dot, like a sunspot, but that's going to be... Uh, that's a day-long event that will start right at sunrise for us here in North America, and it will last for about seven hours hmm. because uh, Mercury is so tiny. So pencil in the date of Monday, May 9th, and we'll do an event on that. Some, maybe I'll come out and set a telescope up here with you, and we'll, we'll watch it together. The eclipse sounds fascinating. As lifetime long, event, lifetime event. As milestone. long as it's sunny. Right. Clouds have to be the worst enemy well, of an that's, astronomer. That's, that's, Is uh, there any way to have a contingency? You, you'll just have to watch the forecast, I guess. Absolutely. I've spoken with tourism people at Hopkinsville. They started getting inquiries from all around the world, from Asia and Europe, in 2007, Charlie, 10 years before. What if it's cloudy? When I started looking at uh, the options for viewing this, I, I talked to some folks in Hopkinsville. The serious eclipse chasers will come in and be in place. What will happen with this is the last 
week to 10 days before all of a sudden this will be all over the news. It'll be the biggest thing going on other than the Kentucky State Fair. For Kentucky, I've already researched it, for August, the likelihood of clear skies is 70%. But you never know. A one-hour cloudburst can come in and ruin the show. All right, now you're going to have your setup there, and my suspicion is you're going to have a group with you. Mm -hmm. You're going to be watching the clock, going to be watching the forecast. If there are clouds coming in, what do you do? How does that change your course? What the series? You can only go on that one path of the eclipse, right? What the serious eclipse chasers will do, well, anybody who wants to see it is day of, or the day before, people will be looking at the forecast, and uh, one of the things I have on my on my website is the clear sky clock, which is something put together by Attila Danko out in, up in Canada, and normally we use it we use it for nighttime. You know, if we're going to have an event and it's okay. going to be cloudy, sure. that kind of ruins the party. But we'll be looking at that days ahead. If it's going to be clouded out, boom, you hop in the car and you drive 500 miles to wherever you got to be to see the thing. You know, because, again, this is a lifetime milestone event. Now, I, I, let me add this one caveat. There will be another total eclipse of the sun come through, but it's going to come in the other direction. It's going to come up from the Gulf of Mexico, and I believe it's in I want to say April of 2024. Don't don't hold me to that, but it's in 2023 or 2024, and it's going to sweep up from the Gulf of Mexico and clip the extreme western part of Kentucky again, but this one will sweep up through Indiana and out to the north. Okay. And like I say, 2023 or 2024, I, I don't I don't. So you remember. got a shot if you miss yes, the one. Yes, you, you got a shot. Well, but but uh, this eclipse, the Great American Eclipse of 17, stands to be the the most viewed, largest audience in the history of eclipses. There will literally be millions of people. You can bet there will be webcasts. There's going to be a recreation of what's called the Eddington Experiment. Einstein had, had proposed his theory of relativity. And one of the things old Albert said was, well, one way we can prove my theory of relativity is correct is by observing a solar eclipse. And he said, if I'm right, a large, massive body like the sun will bend light. At the eclipse of 1919, Einstein was dead on when the Eddington experiment verified Einstein's relativity, Einstein was immediately a superstar in the science community. There's going to be a recreation of that Eddington experiment all across the country from coast to coast. We will be back with our final few minutes with astronomer Mark Stephen Williams and some advice on how to get started in the hobby yourself. Stay tuned. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. We're back with our final few minutes on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and hey, Columbus, the Earth is flat. The Earth is stationary, and the sun itself moves around the Earth. That old concept of geocentrism. Now, this is what they held as fact. As recently as the 1500s, any notions counter to that could really get you into some hot water with the church. Of course, the church declared themselves the authority on science. Now they and we both know otherwise, and the knowledge of the universe continues to unfold. Mark Stephen Williams is my guest this hour on the show. Back with more listener questions from Facebook. PJ from Lexington, she writes, I saw the blood moon. It seems there are more lunar eclipses than solar eclipses. Factually, there are more solar eclipses than lunar eclipses, but the reason it seems the other way, remember how I described to you that 70-mile-wide highway where right. the solar eclipse yes, will be sir. visible? Okay, so you got to be within that 70-mile-wide strip. If there's a lunar eclipse, you see it completely everywhere on a continent. A lunar eclipse, moon climbs into the Earth's shadow. So any place on the hemisphere of the Earth 
that is facing the moon when that lunar eclipse happens, you get to see a total or partial lunar eclipse. Is this a pretty good time coming up within the next year and a half or so to start children, interest in in their astronomy? What's the best way to do that? Absolutely. Well, the most simple thing you can do is just take them out in the backyard. Download a SkyMap. There's a great website, skymaps.com, and every month they publish an online map. The neat part about their maps is the stars for a given month are the same, but what changes is the position of the planets. Sky Maps will give you a list of interesting things going on that month, and their map will also show you where's Jupiter, where's Saturn, if they're visible in the evening sky. Download that. You don't have to be Einstein to enjoy the night sky. Learn the constellations. Go out and learn the Big Dipper. If it's summertime, find Scorpius and Sagittarius. If it's wintertime, find Orion or find Taurus the bull or Leo the lion is another another beautiful one. You don't even have to have a telescope or binoculars. Start just with your eyes. Then, if you're interested, lay out the hammock with a decent pair of binoculars. You can see the Galilean moons around Jupiter. You can see that Saturn has rings. You can see that Venus goes through phases. Again, Venus and Mercury have phases just like the moon because they're inferior. They're between us and the sun. Get on the hammock with your binoculars and sweep the sky. The majority of stars are actually doubles. There's a beautiful double star, which is the beak of Cygnus the Swan, and it's a beautiful red star and a blue star together. Even with a decent pair of binoculars, you can see that. What I tell people to do is download that little sky map, learn the constellations. There are only 88 of them, That's and, and you can see only about half of them. It's not brain surgery. You know, learn those constellations. Then you'll become familiar with the sky. Then you'll start to see, oh, my goodness, now, you know, Jupiter is is in the evening sky, and that's Saturn. You'll recognize how different the planets look as opposed to the stars. Very simple. Get out and enjoy it. Visit the website, stargeezerastronomy.com, or we're up on Facebook. If you got questions, ask me about this stuff. We've had some great questions here, and it's great to, great to hear from your listeners. And we're available, you know, we'll come and do a backyard star party. We'll do something for you at your business. I would like, you know, in central Kentucky, the dis- the the distillery trail now is, is a wonderful thing. I would love to do a star party at a winery or a distillery. Can you work? Or, or let's go hunting. That would be fun. Let's go hunting and fishing. You take me out to the lake. I'll bring the telescope and... We'll have a blast. You're on. Apps are a great thing, and everybody has an app if it's on their tablet or iPhone, iPad. I have one on my phone. It's just called Night Sky. Mm -hmm. And you hold it up. The phone knows exactly the angle where I'm looking. My wife, all the time, she'll be using it more than I will. What is that star? Is that... Mercury Mm -hmm. is that Mm -hmm. Mars, Mm -hmm. and she'll look at it, and she'll figure it out. What I like about this app is that you can tilt it down below the horizon, so you're actually seeing through the core of the Earth, and you'll see the sky from you're not supposed to see. Start basic. Print out that sky map. Take it out in the backyard. Put the phone down. Look at that and say... Okay, and and what's the app you're using? You're 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 more ahead of that than than I am actually. Light years. Light years. Light years. Okay. Ahead. Okay. It's called Night Sky. Night Sky. So so that's a great way to start because you can hold that up and say, okay, there's Scorpius, or over there is the Summer Triangle, or there's Orion, or my goodness, I just found the uh, the Big Dipper. But there's plenty out there from which to pick. All kinds. Just go out there and just show. All kinds, yep. Stargeezerastronomy.com. That's your website? Yes, sir. Go out there and see some things that you have been talking about here for the past hour. We're also on Facebook. Look me up. Mark Steven, thanks a million for coming by. Charlie, my pleasure. I'm glad I'm glad we've done this and, and let's do it again as the seasons pass. There's always something wonderful going on in the night sky. Mark Stephen Williams, the Stargeezer. You can find him at stargeezerastronomy.com. 
Honestly, I've been talking about doing this show for some months. I did a little research prior to to see how really closely does it apply to wildlife in the state. Talked to a few wildlife experts I know at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. They said, by and large, it's intriguing, but Kentucky is a dark state. And so here, it is not studied all that much. Avian ecologist Kate Slanker did agree that migrating birds can become disoriented by light, the light of cities, the light of buildings, causing them to fly directly into the walls or circle around until they just drop from the air from exhaustion. Nocturnal animals do find themselves in light, making themselves more vulnerable to predation. Fireflies, other luminescent bugs like glowworms, they use light to communicate, hence they need a dark night. Even frogs will refrain from singing their mating chorus under the glare of artificial light. It's a topic worth Googling. I saw some information on the Florida Fish and Wildlife website about just these things. And again, my guest can be found at stargeezerastronomy.com, Mark Stephen Williams. We are out of time. This is Charlie Baglin inviting you to join us in a week, and we'll go inside outdoors again here on Kentucky Field Radio. Thank you.